Okay, our last speaker is Andrew Bryan. He's with Grimshaw Architects, who I guess is headquartered in London. Um, Andrew's a highly experienced in a range of project scales and professional services, as well as managing the design and construction process with diligence and autonomy. In 2017, he relocated from London to Los Angeles to establish Grimshaw's new studio. He's licensed architect in California, in the US, United Kingdom, and Australia. Since joining Grimshaw in 20, 2006, Andrew has worked closely with major large transportation authorities and private sector developers, including Network Rail, High Speed 2 in the UK, LA Metro here, LAWA, and BAA. So with that, please welcome Andrew Bryan. Thanks, Andy. What a dubious honor to go last after a very long day. So I can make a commitment to you now that I'll make this snappy, I'll make it quick, and hopefully um, it will be an enjoyable presentation. Much better. Did you get all of that? Anyway, I'm sure you heard me anyway. Okay, so um, to finish off today, I, I would just like to use a couple of our projects to illustrate some recurring design themes that exist in our stations. And at the risk of straying into hubris, what we believe to be the core principles that really help elevate station architecture to you know, moments of poetry and success when it comes to design. Um, the first of those themes that I want to talk about is structural and spatial legibility. Um, we're going to start, well, why not start where it all started, with the first high-speed rail station in London, which is International Terminal in uh, Waterloo. Um, this was actually conceived of as a temporary structure, uh, was in operation for 15 years before the Eurostar relocated to um, its current home in St Pancras. And here, uh, in our work as much as possible, particularly in the transit environment, we look to make a very, very clear uh, structural expression to uh, create an identity that is both appropriate for transportation, a celebration of the structural engineering and the civil engineering associated, but also with a, a somewhat poetic resonance or connection back to the industrial age, which which was the advent and, and creation of the uh, railways as we know it. Um, a single span structure here creates a spatial legibility. The truss elements uh, having to adapt to a complex geometry. So here in the, the dense condition of Waterloo Station in the southwest of London, there was a, a constraint on the geometry that required a lot of curvature and narrowing of the throats and change in the height of the structure. And our solution here was to really embrace the uh, structural requirements and develop a solution that uh, was flexible and able to be adapted. So there are a number of highly repetitious standardized components here and I, I think the ingenious aspect of the design is to allow flexibility within the joint. So you can see there in that component that was developed, there's a hinge mechanism and a sliding flipper gasket glazing joint that allows for these repetitious components to actually flex and become slightly smaller or larger in their spans across the geometry so that we can really uh, optimize the economy of the structure and create a, a flexible space. Again, there's a spatial legibility and a connection to the surrounds through here um, that elevates the, the, the geometry in the station to something that's a memorable experience for the passenger. Um, the second theme that I want to talk about is connectivity, and that's not necessarily just connectivity between the systems, but between the surrounding context, the urban condition, all the way through to the rolling stock where the passengers and users are engaging with the infrastructure. So to illustrate this, I've chosen the Bilma Arena Station Project, which we completed a few years ago now, um, located in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. The base master plan here called for a new connection to bring two adjacent neighborhoods um, together with an unticketed route underneath the station viaduct. And as we all know, one of the big challenges around the planning of infrastructure, the design of infrastructure, is it creates these really significant urban barriers, these walls. And the railway viaduct, in this case, had been doing so for um, generations. And our scheme looked to actually uh, uh, repair that severed relationship. And 
The uh, Ajax for the football supporters among you, I can still say that now because uh, I've only just recently left Europe, so football, i.e. soccer. Um, Ajax Stadium is just to the north and there's an industrial neighborhood to the south. Again, previously never before connected. Uh, now there's an unticketed route. So cognizant of that desired movement and the position that we're actually creating the urban connection, the infrastructure needs to respond. So simple things like the layout of the columns to just reinforce that directional movement to create that, um, that connection. And then thinking again, nobody is going to enjoy, enjoy a 100 meter walk underneath the solid viaduct. So creating bridge structures with voids to allow for daylight to permeate and a visual and spatial connection to the operation of the railway above heightens the experience so that it becomes a more memorable journey for the users. Um, you can see here as well the importance of intuitive wayfinding and spatial legibility. So I think connectivity between those public functions and then up to your ultimate destination, which is the platform environment, through whatever vertical circulation means uh, you need to transition to onto the platform and ultimately onto the trains is hugely important. Delivery from inception. Um, We've found in a lot of our station designs that we really need to be cognizant of the delivery mechanisms and constraints that exist before we think about our conceptual undertakings for the station's identity. To illustrate the point, London Bridge Station, which uh, recently opened to the public in its final phase, um, a project near to my heart, I worked on this for over nine years, um, it's, it needed to remain operational during a full reconstruction. You can imagine shutting down London Bridge Station would bring the city to a grinding halt. So we needed to find a way to minimize the disruption to service and yet somehow deliver a, a new station in its entirety. So this is an abridged version of the construction sequence, which actually was a 96-step station change condition delivery, um, which was highly complex. And it, times like this, you had new construction, operational railway to the south, which is on the left-hand side of the screen here, a construction site in the middle of the, the, um, the railway station, and then on the right-hand side, the pre-existing station infrastructure still in operation. So we were, we were landlocked. And not being able to go back and revisit any of the handed over elements, we needed to conceive of, de of a design that was holistic in its approach so that it created a unified station identity for London Bridge Station, but it could be delivered in this incremental manner. So from the core concept, we dealt with something that wasn't an overarching roof st structure, but was a series of silver ribbons that worked in concert to create a unified expression for the station. And this is a recent photograph of, um, of the station roof uh, canopies there. So they were able to be delivered in very thin slivers, but ultimately when we get through the heartache of having to build this thing um, while running the trains, the ultimate condition will, will be a station that looks as though it was conceived of uh, as a unified singular idea. Um, Beyond the architectural concept, we also need to be baking into our early conceptual ideas deliverability issues. And in this case, the, the timetable is absolutely king. We, you know, we need to get in and out and deliver these sections as quickly as possible. So the roof system was conceived as a, as a prefabricated um, design, a series of cassettes that were craned in at night time um, and were very, very quick in their erection, cladding, roofing, even light fitting speakers, um, all of these things fully integrated in the factory, checked for QA, brought to site, zipped up and assembled at a rate of knots. That extended also to the platform construction, which you can see here on the right hand side, which was a series of precast concrete tables that again were all coordinated uh, so that they could literally just be uh, zipped up on site and then uh, we were away. Ultimately, the, the completed condition um, doesn't show any tide marks or seams, uh, even though it would had to be delivered in this incremental way. And it extends all the way down to the street level concourse environment, which again is creating a new civic space for, for London that allows connectivity from north to south. 
And again, at all turns, we're looking to really celebrate the engineering feats here. So the large civic structures, the, the civic engineering scale structures that are carrying the railways and the platforms above uh, these uh, very, very long span um, structures, we've clad those in a timber uh, cladding to perform the acoustic requirements uh, for the station, but also to bring a level of warmth and humanity into the space so that it becomes a, a room that is welcoming, inviting, and high amenity for the passengers. The next theme I want to talk about is integrated systems. Now, this is this is kind of moving into a more component-based uh, discussion, but uh, we want a commission for Crossrail, which is a new line that runs underneath London from east to west. There's a series of subterraneous stations. It's in effect, a new tube line with uh, double the length of trains, double the capacity. And the commission here was everything that was below grade was our design remit. And we developed a series of um, components that were able to uh, provide a, a, a subterraneous environment for the passenger experience. Now, again, we, we found the inspiration in the engineering methodology. So the boring machines that were creating the concourse and cross passages with the shot Crete retained uh, earth here, as you can see, created these moments of double curvature. And we felt that um, what had never been done in the, the London tube network previously was to celebrate that curvature. And it also has a dual purpose of you know, easing the corner so that it's uh, a little less dangerous if somebody um, on their cell phone manages to walk into the corner on their commute, but also uh, allows for people to um, kind of see around that corner a little bit. So very simply, we looked at a series of, of high Highly repetitious standardized panel units with a couple of specials that are doubly curved around these corners to create a, a very, very crisp and clean platform environment. And we find that this is imperative in a lot of our transportation work, that there is an onus on the architecture to produce an environment that is calm and very, very clear and uncluttered uh, so that the wayfinding is very, very obvious, and that the stress is taken away from a passenger's journey, um, particularly if they're unfamiliar with the station. So again, uh, there's a high level of integration of all of the systems through here. It extends all the way to the platform environment where the platform edge screen uh, that is there for a, a very important safety function to segregate the passengers from the, the, uh, the P-way, the um, train route also integrates digital advertising, digital wayfinding, smoke extract, lighting, as many functions as we possibly can, consolidated into a piece of, I wouldn't even say it's architecture or cladding at this stage, it becomes an, an, an industrial design element at that point. Um, we extend the same kind of rigor of integration and robust detailing into platform furniture and wayfinding totem elements as well. Now, these work as a series of components that are then rolled out across six subterranean stations through central London, but are highly standardized. Innovation, I'm nearly there. There's two to go. Stick with me. Innovation. Um, railway stations are very, very technically demanding types and at times it can feel as though they're so heavily constrained that there isn't much room for some very innovative thinking and I, I, I would contest that and I think the best evidence of, of that particular point is the work that we've done in Melbourne, Australia at Southern Cross Station. We came to this project and the base scheme conceived of by the railway authority was a flat roof with a series of significant exhaust fans to extract the diesel fumes from the uh, rolling stock that sat underneath and uh, we approached them and said that uh, we think that there might be a better way. We think that we could naturally ventilate this space and simultaneously forego all of the operational costs of those fans, uh, all of the maintenance issues that you'll have of maintaining significant exhaust fans over a, a operational railway. And we can give you, for the same price, a really iconic roof that creates a sense of place that will, again, as we've spoken about a few times today, act as a civic heart to the city and the urban condition, a place for people to meet and go to, irrespective of their travel requirements. 
Um, so we managed to do that with a series of uh, moguls that allow the diesel fumes to pool and then utilizing the prevailing breeze that comes off the adjacent Port Phillip Bay in Melbourne, uh, whisks those away through natural means. And uh, to ensure that there's no fume transfer, we had those peaks out of sequence as well, which again sort of further enhances the uh, aesthetic geometry and the appeal of, of the station. So through a very, very functional conceptual idea, we're able to generate a, a, a station identity that I, I hate using the word iconic, but I, I think let's call it memorable, a very clear, strong station identity that was memorable that contributed to a sense of place and actually was the catalyst for a significant amount of development on the western side of um, Melbourne CBD, which was a reclaimed dockland area that previously hadn't seen the, the kind of uh, development and land value that existed uh, to the other side of the station. Um, right. And I, I, I think the, the point there is um, to reiterate what I said earlier, the geometry of the roof and I guess the uh, unique and special nature of the station as a piece of urbanity within the context of Melbourne has meant that it's been very, very successful as an attractor for a meeting place and a destination for the people in the city. And then finally, the, the last point that I'll make, the last theme that I want to talk about is placing humans before trains. Now, just to be clear, I don't mean placing humans before oncoming trains. And it's um, the most obvious point to make, of course, is that we, I mean, we've been fortunate to work with some incredibly talented railway engineers in our time. Uh, but I found myself on, um, I found myself on occasions having to remind them that we need platforms, we need stations, and we need passengers. The trains and the rails themselves aren't enough. And um, I think uh, it, it, at times there can be pressure to uh, place the operational constraints and the technical requirements of railways above the passenger experience. And as we've heard as a recurring theme both today and in previous conferences here, that the passenger experience is, is paramount. For us, that's a lot about spatial legibility, about intuitive wayfinding, and about daylighting. To illustrate the point, here I'm using the Fulton Center, which is in downtown Manhattan, just adjacent to the World Trade Center site. Um, and this is a new subway station for New York that is very atypical, uh, where it's, it's simple move and gesture, its core idea is to bring a, an awareness of the external environment and natural daylighting down to the platform level of the uh, New York subway. Now we achieve that through um, a very elaborate uh, funnel that um, is, has been conceived as a, of as a collaboration between an artist. In this case, um, uh, J James Carpenter was the artist that we used and created Skynet, which is a series of aluminum panels that have been designed to refract and capture the daylight across the course of the day, refract that onto the space below, and allow commuters to have an awareness of what's happening Externally, Now, uh, I'm sure everyone's well aware and familiar with the experience of, of riding in a typical subway station in Manhattan. It's very constrained, it's very dark, it's underground. Whereas in this condition, um, there's a generosity of space and volume. There's a connection to amenity, retail provisions um, and the like. And we're able to bring daylighting right down to the train level. So you can see the turnstiles on the left are actually at the platform grade. Um, and we've managed to, to, I guess, transform that uh, typical condition of the New York subway into something that uh, is, is elevated to uh, something that prioritizes the human journey a little more than uh, what we have in the past. Thank you for sticking with me. It's been a good day. It's been a long day. But uh, I appreciate your time.